first thing in the morning. So I want you to eat this lamb. I want you to eat these bitter herbs. And I want you to eat this unleavened bread. And the unleavened bread they would eat once a year at the Feast of Unleavened Bread to remember that God had delivered His people. Jesus and His disciples, those closest to Him, are sitting in a room that night and they're eating this meal. Now, Jesus, during this meal, is explaining to His disciples what's about to happen to Him, what He's going to be doing. Because Jesus came to this earth for a very specific purpose. You know, the people were wanting a king who would deliver them. Jesus was a king. But he, and He was going to deliver them, but not quite the way they understood it. Jesus took these things like this bread, and He gave it a new meaning. He explained to them that He was soon to be betrayed. And then He was going to be killed. And we'll talk a little more about that as the story goes on. But during that meal, Jesus took a piece of that bread... And he, he took it and he blessed it, or he gave thanks for it, and he broke it, and he gave a piece to each of them. And he said, take, eat, this is my body given for you. He was telling the disciples that his body was going to be given up for them. And then he took a cup, a cup of wine that they had with that meal, and he held it up, and he blessed, and he gave it to them, and he said, "Drink this. It is the blood, or it is the blood of my covenant, my the new covenant that is poured out for you." And what Jesus was telling them was that he was going to give his body, and he was going to give his blood for them. You see, <coughs> where Moses had delivered the people out of physical slavery. Jesus is delivering the people out of spiritual slavery. Back in Moses' time, it was the Pharaoh of Egypt who had them in bondage. And now Jesus knows that it's not the Romans that have people in bondage. It's actually the devil. And when the devil has people in bondage, it's not that they have to work out in the hot sun all day long. It's that when they die, they stay with the devil in hell. God didn't want that for His people. And so He sends Jesus into the world to do something and to bring something different. Now the next item that you found in there was some silver coins. <laughs> Those may already be in your pocket. <laughs> thank you, thank you. You will get these back. At the end. You got two. And you got one. And you got one. You scored big. <laughs> All right. And you guys can pick those up when you're done. At that meal that night, while Jesus is eating this meal with his disciples, he told them, he said, guys, one of you is going to betray me. And they all started talking to themselves, going, oh, surely it's not me. Surely it's not me. Surely it's not me. And Jesus told them, he said, the one that dips his bread into the bowl with me, that's the one that's going to betray me. About that time, a guy named Judas reached over and dipped his hand into there. And he looked at Jesus and he said, surely it's not me. And Jesus said, yes it is. You see, Judas was not a very upright guy. And in fact, before that meal even, Judas had gone and he had met with the Pharisees and the leaders of the people, and he had asked him, he said, hey, what will you give me if I give this guy up to you? And you might say, well, why would anybody want to do anything to Jesus? But you need to understand that when Jesus came, all of the religious leaders and all the Jewish leaders, they started getting really upset with Jesus because He was becoming a lot more popular than they were. In fact, he was telling them, you know, everything you've been telling these people, you're missing some of it. In fact, you're telling these people to do something, but you're not even doing them. You're not really living the way God called you to live. Well, they didn't like that. So they wanted to get rid of Jesus. You know how they wanted to get rid of him? They wanted to kill him. So Judas goes to him, and he's one of Jesus' closest disciples, and, and Judas says to him, what will you give me to turn this guy over to you? And so they counted out to him 30 pieces of silver. And so that night, after that meal, Judas leaves, and he goes to the leaders of the Romans, or to the leaders of the Jews, 
And, and he tells them, he says, hey guys, listen. Jesus is eating the Passover meal with his disciples. And I've been with this guy for three years now. And every night, every night after the Passover, he always goes out to the Garden of Gethsemane and prays. So come with me, and, and I'll give you a signal. The guy that I walk up to and kiss, that's Jesus. And so arrest him. And so Jesus is in the garden with his disciples. He's just had this meal. He's just given them the bread. He's just given them the cup. And he's told them, I'm going to be betrayed. I'm going to be handed over. I'm going to give my body and my blood for you. And as he's talking to his disciples, Jesus walks up. Walks up to him and kisses him on the cheek. My wife doesn't do that when I kiss her. Sometimes. Judas walks up and kisses him on the cheek. And this crowd of people with clubs and sticks come up and arrest Jesus. Next item that you found was a, a wreath. It's stuck on your letters. There we go. Okay. A wreath. Jesus was arrested that night and they took him in front of the, the Jewish leaders. Now the Jewish leaders had hired and paid people to say all kinds of things about Jesus because they wanted him done away with. They wanted him found guilty. They wanted him found so guilty that, that they could put him to death. And so they take him before these leaders and, and the Jewish leaders, they had all of these folks come in and, and they gave all these trumped up charges and, and they finally said, okay, he's guilty, but we can't kill him. The Romans won't let us do that. And so they took Jesus and they led him before a guy named Pontius Pilate, who was the leader of the Romans there in that, in that area. Pontius Pilate takes Jesus in and asks him all kinds of questions. Hey, they're telling me that you claim to be the king of the Jews. Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus says, yeah. yeah, you said so. And they ask him all kinds of questions. And finally, Pilate says, you know what? This guy is innocent. And he goes out to the Jews and he says, hey, I find no basis for the charges against this guy. Let's let him go free. And the Jews all started shouting, crucify him, crucify him. Finally, Pilate thought, you know what? These guys are going to start a riot. And the emperor of Rome doesn't like riots, and so we can't have a riot, so I'll just give them what they want. Crucify him. Even though he's innocent. So the soldiers take Jesus, and they lead him away. They whipped Jesus with leather straps, with rocks and pieces of glass and nails in the end of them. They beat him with sticks. They punched him in the face. They took a, 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 a strand of, of thorny bushes and they made it into a wreath and they stuck it on his head. And then they would beat him in the head with clubs and they'd punch him in the face and they'd spit on him. And they were mocking him and making fun of him and they took a purple robe and they put it around his back after they had you know, pulled all the hide off of his back and they threw this robe on there, and they came down and said, Hail King of the Jews! Hail King of the Jews! In a good German accent. And <laughs> then they'd get up and they'd pull the robe off and they'd beat him some more, and then they led him away, finally to crucify him. Which brings us to the cross. They took Jesus after they had beaten him. And the tr traditional way of doing things was they would take the cross piece of the of the, the, the main the cross beam of the cross. They would put it on the shoulders of the person to be crucified. They would make him carry it all the way through the city up to a place called Golgotha, the place of the skull. Jesus was so weak from the beating that he had endured, that he wasn't even able to carry the beam with his own cross. So they caught a man from, named Simon from Cyrene and they made him carry that for Jesus up to the place of Golgotha. And there is where they actually crucified him. Which brings us to the nails. 
you will show me those, please. See, the way they crucified people was they would lay them down on a big wooden cross and then they would take the nail and they would drive it through the wrist like what we see up there. One on each wrist. They'd cross the feet and drive one through there and then they would lift the cross up and let it fall into a hole, wedge it up there and let the person slowly, slowly die. It was a terrible, terrible, agonizing way to die. And as Jesus is hanging up there, you know, you look up and you think, this is the Son of God. This is the King. Why is He hanging on this cross? I mean, after all, He could have, he could have just said, okay, Dad, I'm done. And God could have sent a whole troop of angels down that could have just wiped out the Romans and, and just pulled the nails out. And Jesus could have been healed instantly and no more pain and no more suffering and no more anguish. But instead, Jesus sat there on that cross for six hours. Those nails went through the nerves in His hands, which made His hands spasm like that. And the ones in His feet crushed the bones in His feet. And as He hung there, He could only... He could only inhale. He couldn't breathe out because of the diaphragm was stretched. You know what that means? Here, stand up. Let me just hold you up by your arms for about an hour. No, let's don't do that. <laughs> but all he could do was, was inhale. He couldn't exhale. And so to exhale, he had to push himself up and pull with his hand. So he could breathe out. And he said, well, why would he do that? And I want you to understand that hundreds of years before, God had written about this very moment because that is why Jesus came. God had said all of those years ago something about Jesus. He said, He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon Him and by His wounds we are healed. You see, we have to understand that, again, Jesus came to set us free. But not because somebody has us slaves and working hard for them, but because we're slaves of the devil. We're slaves of Satan. And what that means is, any time in our life we ever do anything that God doesn't want us to do, is called sin. And when we sin, we deserve death. In fact, what God says is that the wages of sin is death. So have you ever sinned? Have you ever done anything in your, in your life that you don't think God really wants you to do? Have you ever lied about anything? No, I'm not. You're not going to admit, right? Do you have brothers or sisters? You're not sure about that one either? Okay. <laughs> have you ever treated one of them badly? Okay. We'll, we'll talk in a little bit. I know you've got a sister. Never once have you ever gotten angry with her, done anything mean to her. All the time. Okay, all right. What about you? You ever done anything that you think God probably wasn't real happy with? No. I tell you, man, I am just, I'm humbled up here to be in the presence of such glory. <laughs> Anytime we do anything that is not pleasing to God, that's called sin. And I've done a few of those things. And most of us here have. And what God said is that anytime you sin, the only thing that will pay for that sin is your death. But if you die to pay the debt for your sin, then you're just dead and it's all over. Jesus comes into the world and He lived a life where He never sinned even one time. And so He didn't owe any debt. He didn't owe any death. But what He did is He said, Father, I will die for Him because I know He sinned. And I'll die for Dave. And I'll die for Ken. And I'll die for everyone that's here this morning because I know that they have sinned. I know they owe a debt. I don't owe any, so let my life pay their debt. 
He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquity. And by His wounds, you and I are healed. The next item you found was some dice. I know your problem is you loaded that bag up with eggs. Too, and now you can't find anything, huh? I know you've got it in there. Okay. While Jesus was hanging on that cross, bleeding and in anguish and suffering, the soldiers took his clothes. He was wearing five items of clothes. There were four soldiers. So they each took one of the items of clothing and they had one piece left over and they said to themselves, they said, hey, you know, this is one solid piece woven from top to bottom. Let's don't tear it. Let's cast lots and see who wins the thing. And so that's what they did. And you may say, well, what's so big about that in the story? Well, what makes that important is hundreds of years before, God had said, they will cast lots for my clothing. They will divide my belongings. You see, everything that God had ever promised came true in Jesus. Every promise God ever made, God keeps. Next time you see a paradise, remember that when God promises something, like He's going to send a deliverer, God doesn't renege on His promises. He always comes through on His promises. I think the next item that you found in there was some vinegar. I think we should just you know, pass this around and let everybody dab just a little bit of it on their wrist. And there, so we just get the good aroma of vinegar. Any of you, any of you dye eggs this year? few of you. <laughs> I always loved it when I was a kid because we always dyed our own Easter eggs and then your hands smell like vinegar for like two days. Jesus is hanging on the cross and he realizes that he's finally done everything that God sent him to this world to die. And he said, I am thirsty. And next to him there was a, was a, a tub that had some wine vinegar in it. And so they took a sponge and they soaked it in the vinegar and then they put it on a hyssop stalk and they held it up to Jesus' lips and he took a drink. The last thing Jesus ever tasted on this earth was vinegar. Have any of you ever tasted vinegar? Do you want to? No? Do you want to? Why not? Because it's gross. It's bitter. Remember once I got it, I snuck into my grandmother's uh, cupboard, her cabinet, and there was a jug in there that had pictures of apples on it. I told you adults can't read, they just look at the pictures. I, I was a little younger, you know, okay? But it had pictures of apples on it and it looked like apple juice. And so I grabbed it and I poured me a big glass. I don't have a very good sense of smell. And so I took that glass and I like that, it was apple cider vinegar. That is it, nasty stuff. That's the last thing Jesus tasted because after he did that, after he drank that vinegar, it says he raised his head up and he said, it is finished. And then he bowed his head and the Bible tells us he gave up his spirit. Now that's really important. Because you see, no one killed Jesus Jesus gave up His life to pay your debt. He gave up His Spirit to pay your debt so you can live forever. The next time you smell vinegar, I want you to think about the fact that Jesus gave His life. He gave His body. He gave His blood. For you. I'll set that one there because I got vinegar on my fingers. The next item that you found was some spices and some perfume. Some of you may have picked up some strips of linen too. After Jesus gave up his spirit, he died. 
Thank you, sir. And a man named Joseph of Arimathea went to Pilate, and they and he asked if they could please have the body of Jesus so that they could bury him. A guy named uh, Nicodemus came with him, and they brought 75 pounds of spices and myrrhs and oils and stuff like that. And you may say, well, why? Why did they bring all of that stuff? Well, you see, when Jesus died, it, it says in the Bible that there was a garden in that place where he was crucified. And in that garden was a tomb that had never been used before. And so that's where they placed Jesus. Now, they didn't dig a hole in the ground and bury them. What they did is they dug a hole into the side of the rock and they left a little slab and that's where they put the body. Well, you know what happens to something that's been dead for a few days? Este huele mal. It stinks. Have you ever driven by a dead skunk or something on the side of the road after a while and it smells? Yeah, it's pretty bad. And so what they would do is they took Jesus' body and they, and they smeared it with all kinds of oils and perfumes and, and spices and then they wrapped it in a, in a piece of linen and then they put more, more oils and spices and they wrapped it in some more linen and they kept doing this until they had coated his body with 75 pounds of oils and spices to keep it from stinking. Now what's important for that is these guys knew Jesus really was dead. You know what happens to dead people? They stay dead. And they rot. And they decay. And so they put all this stuff on there. Next time you smell the spices in your kitchen or you smell some perfume, I want you to think about the fact that they put that all over Jesus' body to keep Him from stinking and keep Him from rotting. And then the next item you found was a rock. That's a pretty rock. Pretty rock. Pretty rock. Yours looks wet. You you spilled your perfume. <laughs> it smells like vinegar. It looks wet and it smells like vinegar. These are little bitty rocks. But they represent a great big rock. And that big rock was used for a specific purpose. The Jews, after Jesus was, was killed and after He was dead and after they had put Him in the, in the grave, they went to Pilate and they said, Hey, we got a problem here. This guy said that if we killed Him, He would rise from the dead three days later. And we're afraid that His disciples are going to come, they're going to steal His body, and then they're going to say, Look, He rose from the dead. And then it will be even worse than what we had at the beginning. <coughs> So can you let us post a guard to make sure no one gets into the tomb? <coughs> that vinegar's getting to me. And Pilate said, okay, take a guard and go make, it, make the tomb as secure as you can. So what they did is they rolled this great big stone down in front of the tomb. And they sealed it. I think what they did is they put some posts and they crisscrossed it with leather straps and they put a wax seal there to guarantee that nobody could open that or it would be known that somebody had broken into the tomb. And so they sealed it with this big rock, which leads us then to the last item that you found. You each found an egg and you were so excited. And then you opened it up, and what was in it? Nothing. And most of you can probably figure out what that represents. Early in the morning, on the first day of the week, do you know what the first day of the week is? Any of you? What's the first day of the week? First day of the week. Sunday. Early in the morning, on the first day of the week, which is Sunday, the women went to the tomb because they were going to anoint Jesus' body with more oils and with more <coughs> spices. Why were they going to put more oils and spices on it? Because it would stink. And so they got there to make sure that His body didn't stink anymore, but guess what they found when they got there? That big stone was rolled away. And they thought, cool, now we can go in, we can anoint His body. But they got there and guess what they found inside? Nothing! 
Jesus' body was gone. And they were standing there trying to figure this out. All of a sudden, there's two men standing on either side of them. Their clothes are so bright, they just shine. And the ladies turn around, they were so scared, they fell down. And one of the men said to them, Why are you looking for the, for the living among the dead? He is risen. He is not here. Remember, He told you when He was still with you? that He would be turned over to wicked men, that He would be killed, but on the third day He would rise? He is risen. And the ladies were so excited. They, they ran back and they told the disciples, they said, hey guys, guess what? Jesus isn't in His tomb. He's risen. And you know what the disciples said? You're kidding. That didn't happen. So they got up and they took off running and they ran down and you know what they found when they got in the tomb? Nothing! Because Jesus had risen from the dead. And He did it for you. Because you see, when Jesus rose from the dead, what that proved, and you know, the Jews didn't want Him to rise from the dead because only God can raise the dead. And that means that if Jesus really did rise from the dead, that means that God really did send Him. And that everything Jesus said was true. If Jesus rose from the dead, that mean that meant that death was conquered and God had conquered death. And Jesus rose so that you can live forever. And you can live forever. And you can live forever. That is the story of Easter. And you guys didn't get any candy in your bags, did you? In your scavenger hunt. Except for the eggs you picked up in here. By the way, that was the 50 and over egg hunt that you guys took. But I've got something for you right here. And after we're done with services, you guys can come and pick up your other items. Uh, don't eat that now. You can wait, okay? But you can go back and sit with your parents and let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> Jesus later appeared to his disciples. In fact, that very night, uh, he appeared to them in a locked room. He ate with them. He spoke to them. He let them touch him. He taught them more things. He proved over and over again that he was alive. He had been dead, but he was alive. Peter told uh, the whole group of Israelites after uh, about the day of Pentecost, 50 days after the Passover meal, they are all still gathered in Jerusalem. And Peter is up and he tells them, he said, This Jesus, who was accredited to you by God through all the miraculous things He did, and you know that God really did send Him because of everything He did, but this Jesus, whom you crucified, God has raised from the dead. And God has made Him Lord and King. And, and, and folks, the most important thing that we have to understand is because of that death has been conquered, death no longer holds any power over Jesus Christ. And because of that, everyone who believes in Jesus Christ, death no longer has any power over us either. When we die, it's not forever. And it's not to spend eternity with Satan and his kingdom. But those of us who are in Jesus Christ, when we die, we will rise from the dead and we will spend eternity with God in heaven. And that's not just a myth. It's not just a story some people got together and came up with a long time ago. God proved it by raising Jesus Christ from the dead. The sad reality is that there are so many people that think it is just a story. They think it's just something that we tell is an excuse to hide eggs. And they don't believe it. And the sad reality is that those that do not believe it are still slaves of Satan and will spend eternity with him. Unless you do what Peter told the men, 
in, in Israel that day, the, the people heard this message and it said it, it, it pricked them to the heart and they looked up and they said, brothers, what do we do? And Peter said, repent, which means turn your life around, Quit serving the evil one and serve the one that's true. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is for you and all your descendants and for all those who are far off. This morning, some of you may realize that you have never accepted Jesus Christ. You've never believed the story. You've never known that it was true. And, and I beg you, I plead with you this morning, if you've never accepted it, today is a day of rebirth. It was a little over 2,000 years ago, on the first day of the week, on this day that Jesus Christ was, was raised from the dead. Today is the day that you too can be raised from the dead to a new life. You can be buried just as He was. Buried in baptism and raised to a new life. And if you would like to do that this morning, or maybe you just want to talk to someone about it and get some more information, every Sunday we get together and we celebrate this same thing. And, and at this point we always have what we call our invitation song. We're all going to stand up. We're going to sing a song. If you need to respond to Jesus Christ this morning, or if you just want to ask me some questions about it, this is your opportunity to come down to the front and let me help you in any way that we can. If you need to do that, please come down while we stand.